My name is Tom Keeney, and I want to give the world a wake-up call. We are in grave, grave danger. There is a looming threat to every woman, man, and child on Earth today. And if we don't acknowledge and confront this menace, our civilization may be doomed. The source of this information comes from the memoirs of a man in black. The memoir names names, important people, a lot of them in high-level positions. If they find out about this and my crusade to warn mankind, they're going to do everything they can to stop me from making them public. If the information doesn't get out for the world to see and take seriously, it's going to be too late. All I can tell you is I'm scared to death about it. I love my country. This is my patriotic duty. I've got to do this. And besides, at my age, I've lived most of my life. I can take this chance. The hell with it. Uh, my name's Tom Keating, and I'm originally from New York City. I went to Pace University, and after that, I spent four years in the Marine Corps. I'm a Vietnam vet. Uh, here I am in North Hollywood, and I'm retired. Jim and I had a lot in common. Uh, he was retired, I was retired. We didn't have kids, no close relatives. Now, Joe was a rec recluse, but even so, he started to open up and confide in me. And I got to think of him more as a brother than anything else, and we became kindred spirits. Joe was diagnosed with brain cancer in 2013. Anyway, after he was diagnosed with that, he invites me up to his room, wants to talk to me. I go up there, and he starts talking about how he worked for this super secret government agency back 1970s or something like that. He referred to himself as a man in black. Now, I've heard of that, but I didn't know they really existed, but that's what he called himself. And then it hits me. You know what? He's got brain cancer. He's taking all this medication. That's what's doing it, okay? He can't be in his right mind. He's delusional about this stuff. So the next thing I know, he pulls out this drawer. He sets all these documents and letters and paperwork in there. I'm looking at this, and I know this is the real deal. It's not fabricated. I dealt with this stuff when I was in the military. That's what I did. He's not making this up. I need to get more information. I need to find out what's going on with this, because this, it was unbelievable what he was telling me. As a result of the cancer, Joe decided to write a memoir. As he said it, because he was having a crisis of conscience. He felt it was his duty and obligation to expose the fact that the human race was in great peril and danger because of what the government is doing. He had decided that he was going to write the memoirs on the old hand model. Manual typewriters. Ma manual typewriters. Remember those? Well, that's what he used. He wouldn't use emails, phone, no correspondence, no electronic. Didn't trust that at all. Otherwise, because he knew he was being watched. The memoirs are not here. He's got them stashed in a separate place. And uh, he didn't want to keep them anywhere near where he was because he knew that they would be looking for them. So he made arrangements and he has them in a different location, which is all I can say about it right now. So tell, tell me about what, what this is. OK. Um, Joe has a storage facility but his mem memoirs are not in his storage. It's been searched thoroughly, it has not. When Joe died, I came down, and mm -hmm. here you see, nothing here, I'm gone. But I know the memoirs weren't there. Where are the memoir memoirs now? Well, I'm not gonna be able, I can't tell you that. Until I get, until I get a little bit better, make sure you're right, and then, then we can talk about that a little bit more. But in the meantime, uh, and, that's, and that's also for your protection, by the way, as well as mine. If you know where they are, guess what? <laughs> You're gonna, they're going to be after you, even if you're not. And they know Joe and I were tight. They know we talked a lot. So they're going to put two and two together, I think. I don't have the training and the knowledge like Joe had. I'm just a regular civilian. I don't know. I'm, I walk down the street, and everybody looks the same to me. I don't know. Well, I was supposed to meet Joe for lunch. He didn't show up. I called him, texted him. 
No answer. That's not like Joe, okay? He's always on time, prompt. So right away, I'm concerned. So I decide to go up to his apartment. So I come up here, ring the doorbell and bang on the door. No answer. So finally I said, and I really know there's something worse. I get the manager and we go inside. And uh, that's when we found him. Just laying dead on the couch. And then on top of it all, his apartment's a total mess. Everything all over there. I mean, it looks like it's been ransacked. And I can't get that because it, I don't understand that because it was locked from the inside. So here he is, he's dead, it's all ransacked, locked from the inside, and Joe couldn't do it. He's too frail, he can't move all that stuff around. I say, it's those guys, they knew what he was doing, they were looking for the memoirs, and they went in, they ransacked. And a coroner says, natural causes. But you know what? Mm. I don't believe that. I think they killed him. I don't feel safe anymore. I get the feeling that I'm always being watched. So I travel to populated areas. It's the only way I can focus on my strategy to release the memoirs in the right way. Every day I'm reaching out to publishers, bloggers, conspiracy sites, trying to find someone, anyone, who will take this seriously. Trouble is, the second I mention Man in Black, the door closes on me. I don't think most people think they ever existed, only in the movies. I'm getting desperate. I feel the walls closing in on me. If I'm gonna do this, I gotta do it fast. Because if anything happens to me, nobody will know what lies ahead. Okay, I gotta get this place cleaned up. She's coming over. Anne's the one I told you about. She doesn't approve of this whole thing. She doesn't like it at all. I met Joe through her. She knew Joe before she knew me. He needed a place to stay, so. Uh, she knows there's an apartment in this building, so she's the reason this whole thing happened. If she hadn't brought Joe over here, I never would have met him and never would have had this uh, situation. Yeah, hi, sweetie. How you doing? How, you... How are you? Oh. <laughs> and this is Robert Colson. He's the uh, documentarian that's doing the film. So. Uh, nice to meet you. Okay, hi. he's going to be asking us all the questions. So if it weren't for me. Joe and Tom never would have met. Yeah, there was something about him. He seemed to have this dark side, which, which frightened me. And I've always been taught that I should follow my intuition, and this just didn't seem right. He could release them anonymously if it weren't for this documentary. Now, I know that's your job, and I... I respect you for that and but why does Tom have to be in it as long as it's out in the open it doesn't make any sense for them to do anything to me so that's the reason why we've got to do it this way it's actually protecting me I don't see it that way as long as I have them yeah, and you good. have them yes please I'm good. everything's good I'm sorry I'm sorry I, I have to go I had this dream the other night. I, I can't forget it. I was, uh, was on this table, white table. The room was completely white all the way around me. I, I couldn't move. My hands, my arms, my legs, I couldn't, I felt paralyzed. I, you know, I just couldn't move, I'm just lying there, this white room. And uh, all of a sudden, this figure appears, a man. He was in a dark suit. He was speaking at me, but I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. 
it sounded like he was like when you hear people talking underwater and I it just felt like I was drugged I felt, I felt drugged is what it was he takes his glasses off he had these sunglasses on and uh, his eyes were all black I can't help but feel like it was, it was some kind of a message <laughs> the dream was trying to tell me something that's just haunting me Now, well, here's the bad news. You know, uh, Ann puts my name in a search engine every day because she's worried about me. Mm -hmm. So today, this link pops up. Look at this thing. This is from that documentarian that I hired before you. He says I owe him money, which I do not. And so he posts this thing. And this is a big, big problem for me. Burbank, California man named Tom Keating, who befriended an ex-man in black in the last years of his life. Oh, yeah. Great. Just what I need. My name out there for everybody to know. <sighs> Burbank, California man to unveil memoirs of an actual man in black. Documentarian Eric Hayes, that's the idiot, reached out to us with a story that could blow the lid off the lies and secrets the government has been concealing from us all these years. Hayes claims I've worked on a documentary about a Burbank, California man named Tom Keating who befriended an ex-man in black in the last years of his life. Following his 20 years of service as a silencer, the retired operative changed his identity and became known as Joseph Spencer. Keating, the subject of the documentary, inherited Spencer's memoirs following his death. The Explosive Journal not only details his professional life as a man in black, but also names high-ranking individuals within our government and military. They also reveal accounts of the murders of noted ufologists, UFO witnesses, whistleblowers, abductees, and more. Hayes claims that the most shocking aspect of the memoirs is the revelation of the genocidal global cleansing that has already gone into effect, courtesy of the United States government and an elite secret society that rules every aspect of human existence. Hayes saw the memoirs firsthand and is convinced they are real. The real question to be asked is not when Keating would release this holy grail of conspiracy disclosure, but rather why he hasn't done so already. Uh, I mean, uh, why don't they just sign my death warrant? I mean, now everybody's going to know who I am, and these men in black pals of Joe's are going to come after me, I bet you. So I, I just I don't know what to do now. I think I should just send the memoirs to these guys and let them just go ahead and publish them and just be done with it. And once they're out, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. I don't have to worry about it. See, who are these guys? Top Secret Exposed. See what happens. I'm going to make two copies of the memoirs. I'm going to send one to my friend in Colorado Springs. And I'm doing that because I want somebody else to have a set besides me. It's just a little bit of an insurance, a backup, something happens. Yeah, and besides, nobody knows I'm sending it, so it'll just be me, between me and him. And this plan should work. And another reason why I'm doing this is because that site that posted that article about me, well, I sent them memoirs, and I thought for sure that they would publish them. I haven't heard a word from them, so I don't know what's going on with them. And not only that, I sent them to two other sites. Another site, I haven't heard anything from them either. Another site sent me a one-word answer, fake. Ah! <laughs>
birthday to you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Here I go. Oh. Have a birthday, Andy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Brother, he just came for my birthday. He's going yes. back to Vermont tomorrow. Hello, okay. brother. Hey. His Hi. name is Michael. Nice to meet you. Hi. Hi. This is Claire. Hi, hey, nice Claire. to meet you. And nice Ben. Nice to meet you. Ben Hi, has ben. been... Ben. One of my favorite holidays, occasions, is Anne's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> because not only does she get younger, but she gets... Better. <laughs> so I appreciate how much you care about me and putting up with some of my crazy things, uh, which I hope will soon be over. I hope so too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very now, much. I better Fine. stick with coffee because okay. I think it's a good inspiration. <laughs> Always a good time. Always time to cake. This cake Not looks today. like it has every bit of gluten in it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, oh Tom. What's... <gasps> oh. <laughs> <laughs> My oh. own special <laughs> one. <laughs> He's leaving tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. And I wanted him to stay, but no. He has to get back. Yeah. She's another wonderful woman. Very, very nice. Very pleasant. Say hi, Claire. Hi. <laughs> Maybe she's a little bit camera shy. I don't know. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I always liked your advice. Everything's very, very good. Very helpful. Very good friend. Cheers. <laughs> so I, I think I found someone. He's a psychiatrist. I think it would be really good for him to see him. He's, he's great. Um, that would be the next step. And I think it's very important that we should try to get him there as soon as possible so it doesn't get any worse and we could... But how are we going to approach this without him being offended? Have you suggested anything like that? Him seeing anybody before? Uh, I've tried, but you know, it's like beating around the bush. I don't... Okay. I haven't come right on and said, I think you need this. In our relationship, I'm not a medical professional, yeah, yeah. I'm an English yeah. professor, you know. Uh -huh. He there. thinks he's going to save the world. I just don't know what to do. He seems to be getting worse. And I know the psychiatrist it would be great if, we could, if you could take him there, because he really needs to go. But how do I approach it? Um, well, have you suggested anything like this before? Oh, no. I can't no? do that. Does he get defensive? Or? He, he, he just would think that I, I think he's crazy. And, okay. and I don't think he's crazy. I just I think... Know. I understand. Um, well, would you mind if I, I talked to him? Oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Well, it's when a person, um, sometimes due to an injury or trauma, um, believes that someone is following them or it could be even that they think that someone is in love with them or that someone is there to harm someone who they love or care about and usually it's either exaggerated like seriously mm -hmm. exaggerated mm -hmm. or untrue it worries me a little bit this documentary that um, that you following him around, and he's a delusional man. I'm personally, I'm worried about him. And I wouldn't want to use someone who's ill for anybody's entertainment. Each of my students, and I know what they need to do. And if, if a child is really working and struggling, then I accept that, 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 that they're doing their best. A little more leeway. Yes, now I gotta try but if to they're extremely gifted and case. just sliding well, through, then oh, okay. I, so, I push I them. But that's
Yay. Yay. All right. Beautiful. Yeah, and you saw the latest recidivism report, right, on that CNN that the oh, bombings yeah. going on over there, right? Yeah. And I mean, okay, it's a little nuts, but if you think about it, if they're out there and the drone strikes are going on, and we know we. We're 3,000 miles away. We don't know what's happening. Yeah. Who knows what's happening here? And so we don't oh. care over yeah. here. So you don't know what's yeah. going on yeah. right above the house? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's 100 miles above. It could be a thing. It could be microphones picking up what we're talking about. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean anything by it. It was the dog. It really was the dog. Oh, yeah. 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 It was the dog. Who you knows who he's right. reporting to, right? Yeah. I mean, he could. Yeah. 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 yeah, listen. It's, it's not funny, you know? The government really does stuff like this. You guys just don't really understand, no, okay? No, I mean, of they do. you only right. really knew what's going on. You don't really know, okay? And we're all in very grave danger. This is not a joke. You don't understand what this government is doing. If you only knew. Um, come on, sweetie. I'm sorry, I didn't mean anything okay. by it. It's okay, he's just tired. Sorry, it's it's been a really long day, it's and late, I right. had some wine. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. Just, you know some people get cranky sometimes. Okay, late. he's all right, though. I yeah, yeah, he's fine, anything. he's fine. Last week, I sent the package of the memoirs to my friend in Colorado Springs. He never got them. So this is what happened. Your parcel has arrived at the post office at January 29th. Our courier was unable to deliver the parcel to you. Like I said, I don't know how that's possible. He's retired, he's there all the time. To receive your parcel, please go to the nearest office and show this receipt, which is exactly what he did. So he goes down there, and the clerk behind the counter says that somebody already picked it up. I don't know how that's possible because it's in his name. Now, my friend's home all the time. He's retired. Okay. So, so there's no way he could not be there. Yeah. Well, I think it got intercepted. I'm, uh, I'll bet anything on it. I'm sure that those guys are on to me. There's just been too much stuff happening. This is just another, another thing. And not only that, that website that published the article about me, mm -hmm. I sent the memoirs to, can't find it here. See? That's the site. See what happens? It's not there anymore. I sent them the memoirs. Now I can't find them. I I don't know. There's just another another sign of what's going on. There's somebody hanging out on the corner over here watching me all the time. Knocking on my door, I get phone calls, strange noises, you name it. Nothing I do seems to work. And they seem like they know exactly what I'm going to do, when I'm going to do it, and they stop it somehow. Like Joe told me, I mean, these guys can do anything. They got all sorts of money, they got all sorts of equipment, and sophisticated technology that we don't have any, we don't know anything about. And some of the stuff I read in their memoirs is entirely possible. I don't know, maybe Ann's right. Maybe I'm just batting my head against the wall. But I can't quit now. I, I'm too far in. So I'm, I'm going to send it to you again. But I, I, I'm just going to bet the same thing is going to happen. But this time, let's just be right on it. Let's get, be there before they have a chance to give it to anybody else. Let's try that. All right, thanks. All right, Jim. All right, see you later. Now I got to worry about him. Because if they know he's going to get it, I don't know if that's the right thing to do or not. I don't even know if I should, I could be putting his life in danger if I send it. I just, I don't know what else to do. Okay, so I'm typing in the tracking number. So let's see if I can find out any more information on what happened to this package. Okay, 639, okay, 639. Enter. The tracking number you entered is invalid. Please correct it and retry. 639, 
Nope. Invalid. <laughs> no good. So the reason I'm here right now is because your friend Claire stopped by my studio yesterday. Mm -hmm. the, the gal I met at the birthday party. Yeah. And she wanted to be on camera talking about you and her concerns and a few other things, which I think you need to see. Yeah, well, she wants me to go to a doctor. She thinks I need a psychiatrist, which I am not going to do. Right. She's got Anne involved in this, too. Yeah, well, let me play the video for you. Here we go. It's um, apparent that he's become increasingly more unstable and paranoid. Is mm -hmm. she talking about me? And you, I'm sure yep. you know. And um, I, I suggest that he go to this doctor I know who would, who's happy to help him, who would really be useful for him. Yeah. And he, he, he doesn't want any help. He doesn't. He's in total denial about I don't need his a own state. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I'm just both me and Anne. I'm just very worried that what if he has a mental collapse? You know, he could be in danger for himself. So, um, so what I'm asking you is that if I could be part of this, this um, stuff oh, that I'm no, no, or don't let her be part of this um, project you're you're doing. Um, this would help me assess his mental state so much better to be close to him because he, he doesn't really want to talk to me. So if I could be part of this project, it would be so much easier for me to monitor him. No, there's nothing wrong with me. You don't want to be me. complicit to a person's mental collapse, do you? Of course not. Good. Um, I need you to give me all the footage so I can watch it as soon as possible within the next two days. It's very important so I can assess where he is mentally at this point. Where in God's name is she getting okay, this Okay, well, let me speak to him about that first before I give you the footage. Don't just speak to him. You must convince him. You understand? This is important. Now, the second reason I'm here, I just wanted to ask you, throughout this whole process you've been working with Tom, has there been ever any concrete evidence that any of this is true. Oh, this is getting better all the time. Not exactly. That's what I thought. Um, I've been talking to a guy, a friend of mine who knows a guy, who works for the Department of Justice, and I asked him to do a background check on Mr. Joseph Spencer. This is what he basically found. So, Joseph Spencer's real name is John Alexander Layton. He was born in Jefferson City, Missouri, 1939. He had no formal education and spent most of his youth working at a lumber mill in Warren County, Georgia. From there, he worked as an independent contractor in Cleveland, Ohio until 2005, at which time he retired. He was never married or had any children. Following his retirement, he became a conspiracy theory activist with claims that the moon landings were a hoax, that the government is engaged in, in a human cleansing plot, that space aliens are living among us and working with our military to devise super advanced technologies. That's right. Mr. Layton moved to North Hollywood, California, 2008, and for reasons unknown, changed his name to Joseph Spencer. At no time in his life, at no time, did Mr. Layton serve in the U.S. military or in any branch of government. He was not an intelligence operative, a spy, an agent, or a man in black. Hmm. Which means that the memoirs are complete fabrication written by a deluded individual. I'm giving you this paperwork to show to Tom. He'll probably dismiss it, but at least I want you to know the truth. All of this, everything you're doing, is based on lies. So, this is the background report she gave me to give you, and I think you need to look at that and 
tell me what you think. I want you to know this is all bullshit. I mean, does she really think the Department of Justice is going to release classified information on one of their covert agents to a common civilian? One thing Joe said was that all the men in black had their past histories completely wiped out. A clean slate. This bogus report proves that. I mean, Claire is so naive. I was in the military. I saw classified documents, reports, communications. Joe had all of those in his possession. I mean, this guy could describe the innermost workings of above top secret operations. He drew underground bases, secret departments within NASA, sub basements at the Pentagon, and I'm supposed to believe some common everyday schmuck working at the lumber mill or an independent contractor working for a cement company could know all this? Come on, that's the bullshit. Yeah, I saw your little interview and I'm very upset. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm as sane now as I've ever been, and I resent the accusation. And I don't like you feeding that crap to Anne. I don't care what you think, Claire. I want you to leave me alone, and I want you to stay away from Anne. You know, she hasn't returned any of my calls lately, and I'm guessing it's because of you. And almost no speaking to Robert, he works for me, got it? That's all I have to say, goodbye. I'm sorry, Robert. I think, uh, I think you should go. I, I want to be alone for right now, okay? Yeah, no, that's I'm fine. In. Elsa, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Okay. All right, I'm ready to show you the memoirs. Okay. Now, we're going to go to an undisclosed location. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my vehicle, okay. and you're not going to know where we're going to go, okay? <laughs> Look at this. Oh, that's weird. Uh huh? That's the second time that's happened. Nobody. Nobody here? Now, how could they knock that fast and disappear like that? Mm. You tell me. Mm. All right, let's go. Let's go. So I've, se I've selected portions to read off. We'll do the vital stuff today and more tomorrow. Okay. Okay, here it is. My name is Joseph Spencer. From May 1970 to October 1997, I served the United States government as a top secret operative, but not in a category that is commonly known or understood. I was known as a man in black. Following seven years acting as a counterintelligence agent for the CIA, I was recruited for a new assignment that entailed working within above top secret operations. I was aware of the black budget projects, but never knew the context of them due to their high level of secrecy. Even the president was denied access to their inner workings. Annually, billions of dollars are poured into black projects, which operate without any supervision or intrusion. They have full autonomy. The operations deal primarily with advancing military technologies, most of which have been reverse engineered from recovered alien spacecrafts that had either crashed or were shot down by our military. The public, sadly, will never, ever have knowledge of these operations. This transition in my life happened in 1970. The senior black project director was William T. Latham, who had worked under CIA Executive Director Richard Schlesinger. Latham stated that I was the perfect candidate for my new position. I was a foster child, and I had no connections to existing relatives. I had no friends or social life. It was easy for them to erase my past 
and provide me with a new identity. I gave myself to them as a priest would to his God. But first, my mind had to be erased. I was injected with various forms of mind-altering drugs, LSD, heroin, mescaline, morphine, sodium pentothal, and more. Drug-induced hypnosis followed with anti-grade and retrograde amnesia. The goal was to program me to do two things, kill and forget. After nine months of programming, I had become a man in black. What I later discovered was that not all the men in black were human. About a third were alien hybrids. Their distinctive feature was the absence of whites in their eyes, giving the impression of empty eye sockets. This unsettled me, and it took months to adjust to, to the reality of alien integration. My assignments largely dealt with UFO sightings and crash sites. In August of 1971, I witnessed my first UFO crash site just north of Edwards Air Force Base in California. Inside the craft were three grade humanoids, two dead, one still alive. Also in the craft was a human female abductee. The alien humanoids were transported to the base, but two witnesses had arrived before us and took several photographs. The first surrendered his camera, but the second fled. When we apprehended him, he resisted, and I was ordered to silence him, which I did. The killing of witnesses was executed with a wand that acted very much like today's taser, but the voltage from the wand would cause immediate cardiac arrest and the victim's death would be attributed to natural causes. We silenced countless victims, not only men, but women of all ages and even teenagers. The following day, after each kill, our memories were reset so we would have no recollection of the murders. A good majority of the victims were ufologists and whistleblowers. Among the ufologists I personally silenced were Paul William Cooper, Milton Vigay, Claude Monroe, Anthony Vargas, and noted documentarian Samantha Willis. When my wand malfunctioned with Samantha, I resorted to strangulation. She fought for her life for almost two minutes. In recalling this act, I stared into her pleading eyes for the entire duration with absolutely no remorse, guilt, or feelings. That was how effective the mind conditioning was. And it's her face that haunts my dreams more than anyone's to this day. So they stuffed out a documentarian? Yep. Well, that's not good to hear. Yeah, yeah. All right, move, move, we're going to move on. In 1954, Dwight Eisenhower signed what's known as the Granada Treaty with the Alien Gray Race. In exchange for shared alien technologies, the Greys were allowed to abduct a number of humans annually for medical examination. The Greys also demanded anonymity from the public. A short time later, human technology took a giant leap forward with circuit chips, fiber optics, and lasers. The Granada Treaty is still active today, but the number of human abductions has increased despite objections from the world governments. Now, the really interesting part. Every year, at least eight million children go missing in the world. I can attest that one third of them are abducted by government operatives and transported to any one of the 1,477 underground military installations on the planet, then imprisoned for the remainder of their lives. The children are subjected to biological and genetic experiments dissections and mutilations performed not by human scientists, but an alien gray species. During my stay at the Vanguard underground base north of Phoenix, Arizona, I witnessed many of these procedures. Because there was no form of anesthesia administered to the young patients, the halls reverberated with the screams of tortured children from morning to night. The ones that perished were incinerated in the installation's crematoriums. My point of contact at this base was Lieutenant Colonel Charles T. Leninger, and he was a human-alien hybrid. And get ready for this. In 1994, 
the World Population Summit in Cairo, Egypt, had 160 nations participate, where they all agreed that the human population was out of control and must be stopped because the world is running out of resources. An agreement was formed that would mandate the reduction of humans from 6 billion to 800 million by the year 2030. This meant finding a method or methods to wipe out nearly 95% of the population. Solutions were discovered, investigated, tested, then created, and have been in full force since. The procedures have been inflicted onto the human race are as follows. One, toxic levels of chemically enhanced fluoride have been secretly added to our drinking water over the last 20 years in every city and community on the planet. I personally oversaw the delivery of fluoride barrels to Denver, Chicago, Tampa, and Minneapolis water departments. The adverse effects of fluoride poisoning to the human body are numerous and debilitating. The effects to children is damage to their neurological development, among other serious ailments. Two, man-made viruses and diseases. The AIDS virus, which was a designer byproduct of the American Disease Institute, was distributed through vaccines to the public in 1980. Instituted as a preliminary population control tactic, the results were successful and led to more lab-produced viruses that have since been unleashed onto the public. Among those is the development of a mutated version of the common flu to replicate the 1918 influenza pandemic that killed 40 million people. The first strain of this new flu virus will be released to the public in late 2017. So if we see a flu outbreak in the late 2017 or early 2018 that's killing people, we'll know this is true. All right. Three, killing us from the air with neurotoxins, barium chloride, cancer microbes, and viruses by way of chemtrails, released into the skies daily over all inhabited regions by military aircrafts. The effects of these toxins are severe and over time lethal, causing respiratory ailments, cancer, damage to the immune systems, and sterilization in men. Since the chemtrail plan was implemented, sperm count in men has dropped nearly 50%. If this isn't reversed soon, the human race will face early extinction. Now the grand finale. This is some scary shit. In March 1997, an event known as the Phoenix Lights became the most infamous UFO sighting in history. A mile-wide vessel, clearly not man-made, flew slowly and silently over the state of Arizona and was witnessed by 10,000 people, including the governor of Arizona. To date, there has been no reasonable explanation. But for every witness interviewed, the craft was as real as anything they'd ever seen. Their lives were transformed. They now believe that we truly are not alone. However, there is another truth, for I know what they really saw. In 1986, while stationed at an underground installation near Boulder, Colorado, I was introduced to Project Skybeam by Lieutenant General Andrew Garris. I was then led down a corridor and into a large hangar where a stealth bomber hovered only 20 feet above me. I stood there confused. Then Garris looked over at me and smiled, then asked if I was certain of what I was seeing. I replied, of course. What else could it be? I was then shocked to find out that this wasn't a real craft. It was a projected hologram. Since the early 1950s, scientists have been developing holographic technology and over the years improved it to a state that we can only imagine. As I stood there staring at the bomber, which looked so absolutely real and solid that I could reach up and touch it, I contemplated the possibilities. What if this projection was a thousand feet up in the sky? How would anyone know that that was an illusion? The Phoenix Lights craft, witnessed by 10,000 people, was the first grand scale sky beam test upon the public. It succeeded beyond expectations. In October 1938, Orson Welles unleashed his War of the Worlds radio broadcast to the American public. It was so realistically portrayed 
Vast portions of the population went into panic. Terrified citizens scrambled to evacuate their cities in droves. America had been easily tricked by very simple means. To amplify this response, those who are truly in power of not only our country, but all the countries on the planet, and who are the true purveyors of the depopulation process, have formulated the final stage of their sinister plan. In the year 2024, a global event will alter the course of mankind's future. The world will stand witness to a massive alien invasion. Thousands of projected holographic alien warships will blanket the skies, sending people into a global panic. Real military crafts within the holograms will inflict actual damage to the surrounding areas to sell the gimmick. And as a result of the ensuing human chaos, a one world government will immediately form without any resistance from the people. They will be the new world order. Once this happens, we as a people will be doomed to enslavement and accelerated depopulation. With that said, the only hope for human salvation is to acquire and spread the knowledge of these activities and agendas. Resist, retaliate, then conquer this imposing enemy. The time is now, as humanity is rapidly approaching its final days. The knowledge of what's coming is taking its toll on me. I see all of these people living their lives, enjoying themselves, planning their futures. I'm oblivious to the fact that it's all going to end soon. Here I am at a park where children are playing and in the skies above, I can see the chemtrails, poisoning the air and slowly killing us all in plain sight. I've never felt so helpless. I want to scream out to the world, but I'd only be laughed at, ridiculed. When Claire said the memoirs were a fabrication, I secretly wish she was right. Then they could sleep at night. But I know, beyond a reasonable doubt, that it's all true. That Joe was being completely forthright. I saw it in his eyes. I heard the tremor in his voice when he spoke about it didn't come off as an admission. It was more of a deeply concerned confession. He was scared for us all. And that says a lot coming from a man who was a government assassin. All right. Well, I can't get a hold of Ann. She's not answering her phone. The, none of my texts, emails, no, nothing's being answered. Even her sister lives in Utah, though, but she's been trying to reach her. No calls, no nothing. I'm going to have to go over there and find out what's going on because something's wrong. Something's really wrong. Well, the car is here. That's weird. Eh? Joe, what is it? Hmm? 
The phone, oh, it's ringing from the, sounds like it's ringing from the bedroom. This is her phone. Oh, wow. Okay. What the heck is this doing here? Okay, it says something really wrong. Okay. I, I'm gonna, I'm calling the police. I'm calling the police because uh, I'm file missing, missing personal file support. Missing, yeah. Wow. All right, I've called police on the way. This poor dog hasn't eaten in days. Have you, Charlie? Well, come on, let's go. Okay. Come on, baby. Come on. Yeah, They're on their way. Police are on their way. Over here. I hope they don't take forever. I'm having trouble right now. Sorry, I, I, I know I'm, I hope to God nothing's happened to her over this stuff, these guys. If something happened to her, it's my fault. It's going to be my fault. I mean, stupid thing. I should have never, I should have never let Joe talk me into this. Something's happened to her. And it's not good. I can tell you that right now. Well, we just left Dan's and the police took their missing persons report, but refused to go on camera for some reason. Yeah. Go ahead, tell them what they did. Well, as soon as they got there, they saw me with the camera and they walked over and told me to stop filming. And then they made me erase the shots I did of them and watched me do it on the spot. Well, I don't know about you, but I got a weird vibe from them. And did you notice when they first got there, the officer referred to me as Mr. Keating? How did he know my last name? Yeah, that's right. I only right. gave my first name to the 911 operator. Yeah. That's very, very suspicious, if you ask me. And, and I'm wondering about the guy in the back seat of the police car, because he didn't have a police uniform on. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't get a clear look at him, but he was not in a police uniform, and he was definitely watching us. Yeah. So what are you seeing? I think, I think we're being followed. Really? I wasn't quite sure, but now I am. All right, let's see if he's following. Yep. Yep, he's following us. Dance. Why? Let's see. Yep. Yeah. There he is. You know what? I've had, a, I've had enough of this. He stopped. Hey! Why are you following me? Huh? Come on! Hey, come here! Son of a... I bet anything he knows what happened to Ann. Pissing me off, that son of a bitch. Wow. Fed up with this crap. Hey. You're not gonna believe this. I got something to show you. Okay. What happened? Let's go this way. Okay, so I just want you to see it, okay? And I'm sorry, I just. Well, it ain't good. Hmm. Wow. Your place got ransacked. Wow, oh, you're right. Oh, I 
it's like you took about your bedroom. So, so uh, you were gone, and what happened? I mean, okay, I was, yeah, I was out doing errands, but like I normally do, mm -hmm. I come in here, boom, I see all this. Yeah. Were well, you gonna call the police? I thought about it, but what good is it gonna do? I know who did this. And by the way, I don't even trust the police. She lives next door, right? Uh huh. She's saying, yeah, two guys. Walking around back here, back down around here. Oh, wow. And over back and around the alley. I went inside for a while. She said, then I came back out and they were gone. And I don't know if anybody else saw them or not. I don't know, but I, I'll bet, I'll bet anything it's our, it's our friends. I, I, I can't stay here another minute. I, I got to get out of here. Right. I no, I would in, too. I'd be getting out of here. Right I know now. my life's in danger. I just, I know. Yeah. I'm going to turn my phone away. Okay. Find a place to go that no one else knows but me. Just go into um, hiding, or? So, yeah, I'm just going to go underground, and I'll get in touch with you. Okay. I wonder how they got in here. Yeah. They saw the two men the two, in the dark suits, that's it. She didn't know what they were doing, anything. Obviously, it was them. Right. And and still missing. The guy who knows what happened to her. There's no sense in taking a chance. No sense in and, and staying here. And for what reason? I think you're doing the right thing. I think just going into hiding and just laying low. Just gotta think about it. Think, think something. Yeah. And you know that Anne's been missing, right? Yes. And now Tom has left town and you don't know where he is? I've had no correspondence with him, no. When's the last time you saw him? Mm, about two weeks ago, his place had been ransacked. Oh, come on. He did that himself. Either out of his own delusion or a stupid ploy to convince everyone why he had to leave because his life was in danger, right? That's how I understood it. Well, just so you know, I have to tell the police about Tom's mental condition, and now it's very likely that he'll be the primary suspect in Anne's disappearance. So it's very important that we find out where Tom is. So who do I contact if I hear from him? Just call me as soon as you do. I have daily communication with the lead investigator. Okay. Robert, you do understand that if you're concealing his whereabouts and not telling me what else you know, that you're an accomplice to a very serious crime. I wouldn't want to see you go to prison over this, because that is what will happen if you're lying. I'll be expecting your call. Goodbye. This is Hal Camillo speaking to you from the Jackson County Sheriff's Department here in downtown Pascagoula. Well, this morning we had uh, an interrogation or interview with two of the gentlemen that reportedly sighted and were taken aboard a UFO late last night in the Goche area. It landed uh, approximately two feet off the ground, never touched the ground, and two creatures came out and carried them in aboard. Regarding the truthfulness of his statement that he saw a spaceship, three space creatures, and was taken to this spaceship on October 11, 1973. It is my opinion that Charles Dixon told the truth when he stated, number one, that he believed he saw a spaceship. Number two, that he believed he was taken into the spaceship. And number three, that he believed he saw three space creatures. It hovered about three feet off the ground. Uh, three creatures uh, 
who were described as about five feet tall with big eyes, pointed ears, wrinkled skin, a pale colored skin. They had claw-like arms and feet came out uh, and they hovered or floated. Uh, they didn't walk. They kind of uh, uh, floated out, just suspended him in midair with nothing to hold him up except that he was weightless. And they took this big eye-looking uh, object and went over him, I guess you'd say like an x-ray, like you take an x-ray or, or take a, a picture of him. And it seemed to, something like a big eye. I keep referring to it as an eye because it was about the size for a small baseball. In the end, it was focused toward me. It was a different color or different light. So once the craft deposited you and Calvin back on the bank without any further ado, it just departed. It departed, that's right. It departed. Well, the Air Force won't talk about those things. Uh, they didn't. Uh, they didn't even want to talk. Or, or, you know, they didn't want to talk with us about it. Were you afraid during this entire thing? I certainly was, and, and uh, 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 I can explain that. Just normal fear is something that, that you expect here on this earth. But this was something that uh, wasn't supposed to even exist, and it's fear that you can't even explain. Were you followed? No, I don't think so. I didn't, I didn't see anybody. How about your groceries? Oh, thank God. I haven't eaten for two days. My this is for your... Wow. So there's no electricity here? No, they renovated. Oh, okay. Who, whose house is this? Vance, Vance Brothers. Oh, like it, yeah, it's the guy that was at the party. I need to replace that. Uh, Hide out. Uh, I came up here a couple of days ago. I had to break into the place. Yeah. He doesn't even know I'm up here. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, I just I just grabbed whatever I could. What was that? Well, Colorado Springs said with a friend of mine. The guy you sent the memoirs to. Yeah, right. I gave him a call. Doesn't answer. Some guy answers. Won't give me his name. Wants my name, wants my phone number. <laughs> I know so where you I call am. him and then so, some other person answers? Yeah, right. I didn't like it. I hung up. Holy. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think, I think they got rid of my buddy, wanted me to call, traced that call, and I said, you know what? I'm hightailing it out of here. I think something bad happened to Ann. Everybody else that's been involved in this fiasco, they're either disappeared or dead. Listen, if I were you, okay, I'd get this documentary done and completed, and I'd get it released free on every single platform you can. Get your face and name yeah. out there, no, and then I you'll be so. safe, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm gonna do. I'm gonna head up north to Canada, and I wanna disappear in those big woods that they have. <laughs> uh, like possible. But uh, I'm hoping I can find someone that will release the memoirs up there. Right. So why don't you just, just you know, turn yourself into the police or c commit some kind of petty crime and just sit in a police cell, I mean, a, or a jail cell, you, you'd be much safer. Police? Police? <laughs> I wouldn't last 10 minutes before they whisk me out of there and who knows where I'd wind up, some dulcet base, and, or even worse. Now, that's the worst thing I could do. I need to protect myself. Now, don't freak out when I show you this, okay? Oh, wow. Yeah. I bought it at the local gun store today. And I'm not afraid to use it. I can defend my life. You think Those you could actually, are... I mean, you think you could actually shoot somebody? I'm a Vietnam vet. Like I said, I don't mind protecting myself. And uh, 
These guys want to have it out before I go out. I'll go out guns a blazing. Well, hopefully he doesn't come to that. What the hell is Who could that be? I don't know. Why don't you go upstairs? Go upstairs. Keep filming.
smart to call the fire department. We were at your place today. We confiscated your computer, your external drives. We have everything. There's nowhere you can run. Nowhere you can hide. We will find you. I'll take that.